Hello and welcome. It's 10 a.m. on Wednesday, the 28th of January. You're tuned into our mid morning newscast here on Adidang TV. It's great to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. Nine people are dead after gunmen storm a hotel in the Libyan capital of Tripoli. There are reports a Korean national was among the dead, but Seoul's foreign ministry says it's yet to hear anything official from the Libyan government. A new plea from the Japanese hostage being held by Islamic State, holding a photo of a captured Jordanian pilot, Kenji Goto, says both will be killed within hours if a female terrorist is not released from death row. Plus, the government and Hyundai Motor Group are teaming up to turn Korea's southwestern city of Gwangju into a development hub for next-generation fuel cell cars. But we begin with the chaos in Tripoli after a pair of suicide bombers stormed a luxury hotel in the Libyan capital city, killing at least nine people, including possibly a Korean national. Gunmen burst into the five-star Corinthia Hotel on Tuesday, running through the lobby and up to the 24th floor of the hotel, which is a space frequently used for diplomatic meetings. Security personnel evacuated most of the guests, including, in fact, the country's prime minister and a delegation from the U.S. Now, Korea's foreign ministry says it has yet to receive confirmation from Libya on reports that a Korean was among those who unfortunately lost their lives, citing a security official AFP had said a Korean, an American, a French national and two Filipinos were among those killed. A group pledging allegiance to Islamic State said the attack was revenge for an al-Qaeda terror suspect who died uh, in the U.S. earlier this month, days before he was due to face trial. Back here in Korea and working in conjunction with the nation's largest automaker, Hyundai Motor Group. Uh, ha the Korean government, together with Hyundai Motor Group, has announced a plan to develop in the southwestern city of Gwangju a center for developing and manufacturing hydrogen vehicles. Che Yusan reports. President Park on Tuesday launched an industrial complex in the southwestern city of Gwangju to help Korea emerge as a global leader of fuel cell vehicle production. The complex will work closely with the country's largest auto group, Hyundai, to develop next-generation fuel cell cars, widely regarded as future eco-friendly transportation means in the developed world. Fuel cell vehicles, or FCVs, produce zero emission as they are run by electricity generated from a chemical reaction of hydrogen and oxygen in the air. The president said she anticipates a successful integration of Hyundai's capabilities to mass-produce fuel cell vehicles and Gwangju's advanced hydrogen technology infrastructure to produce innovation. Compared to electric cars, they can travel up to four times farther in distance from a single charge, with charging taking only three to five minutes. Hyundai Motor is the world's leading maker of FCVs, having started manufacturing the hydrogen version of its Tucson SUV in 2013. It aims to take up half of the global fuel cell vehicle market share by 2018. But other global brands are catching up fast. Japan's Toyota recently started selling its FCV, Mirai, at less than half the price, with hopes to sell more than 3,000 units by the end of 2017. Industry experts say the government and conglomerates should not only focus on R&D, but also investing in infrastructure such as setting up more charging stations to increase sales, which in turn lead to more investments. Another task is to find ways to bring down the sale price by nearly a third from the current $140,000 for a Tucson FCV. Che Yusan, Arirang News. Korea is taking steps to strip away cumbersome regulations that stand in the way of innovation in the field of fintech or financial technology. The industry is growing at a staggering pace with large corporations and startups shuffling for space in the highly competitive sector. Our Kang Cherry reports. The day when you can wire money to your friends after just a quick fingerprint or retina scan may not be too far away. Korea's financial authorities have announced a set of measures to make sure the fintech industry, short for financial technology, ensures the ultimate convenience. 
the transaction limit is set to go up and the entry barrier is to go down. The idea here is to simplify mobile payments and encourage innovation in finance. In the bigger picture, it's part of the Bakune administration's campaign to deregulate and find new growth engines. The volume of mobile payments has been growing fast in Korea, too, with the total flirting with the $3 billion mark as of the second quarter of last year. And with digital wallets such as Apple Pay and Alipay replacing cash and credit cards, the global market is expected to grow fast. There are security concerns with cyber breaches at major government agencies and banks over the past few years in Korea. Authorities say they are planning to hold the IT companies involved legally responsible and increase the level of compensation if breaches occur. Now, after this latest move to cut to some of the red tape, the focus is on how traditional banks will take to the challenge and how new startups will make names for themselves in the new financial landscape. Kang Chedi, Arirang News. Now, low oil prices here in Korea have contributed to an uptick in the nation's consumer sentiment, which rebounded in January after falling for the previous three months. So, Hang Jie has the details. Consumer sentiment in Korea improved for the first time in four months in January. The Bank of Korea says its consumer sentiment index came in at 102 this month, up a single point from a month earlier. The figure, however, is lower than the level posted last May when consumer confidence was hit hard by the Seoul Ferry disaster. Experts also say that the uptick cannot be interpreted as a strong sign of a solid recovery momentum. It's more like the index is reflecting people's hope over the new year that things are going to be better with the drop in global oil prices, giving more leeway for spending. The central bank also says that it's about time for a rebound, adding the index, which reflects consumers' overall economic outlook, has never fallen for three or four months in a row except in cases when there was a major shock in the economy. Still, a reading above 100 means optimists outnumber pessimists. In fact, there are conflicting signs that the country's exporters are not faring well. A new survey of around 900 exporters shows that more than a third of them are skeptical about the economic conditions this year. Less than a quarter said they felt positive, while the rest said the conditions should be manageable. Now, all eyes are on the new economic data for the first quarter this year, which will give a clearer picture of whether the domestic economy is on a stable recovery track. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. South Korea has been ranked in the top 30 countries in terms of economic freedom. The list, drawn up by the U.S.-based Heritage Foundation, gives South Korea a score of 71.5, which is 0.3 points higher than last year. South Korea also jumped two ranks from 31st to 29th. The country scored relatively high in terms of giving local companies and its finance sector freedom to do business. But it scored poorly in terms of giving freedom to labourers and also public transparency. Hong Kong topped the list, followed closely by Singapore. North Korea was rock bottom. Another video has surfaced featuring the Japanese hostage Kenji Goto in which the Islamic State group appears to be making a revised threat and imposing a new, much tighter deadline. For more on this, we connect live to Eunice Kim, joining us at the News Centre. So Eunice, this time the deadline is just 24 hours. Uh, then the extremists say they're going to kill the Japanese journalist, Mr Goto, and a Jordanian hostage. That's right, Mark. They're upping the ante, and this has now become not only a problem for Japan, but also for Jordan. That Jordanian hostage is a pilot who was captured by the Islamic State group back in December when his F-16 went down near Raqqa, which is the jihadist group's de facto capital. Now, in the two-minute video posted on YouTube on Tuesday, an audio statement purportedly read by Goto says he has only 24 hours to live, and the Jordanian 
Ukrainian hostage Muath al Kasesbe, whose picture he holds up even less, unless the Iraqi female fighter IS has been demanding is released. You'll remember that fighter was an al Qaeda militant on death row in Jordan for an attempted suicide attack that killed 60 people back in 2005. The voice on the audio also said this would be the final offer made by the Islamic State group good for the following 24 hours. Tokyo is saying that it is working to verify that video. And Eunice, uh, what do we know about the efforts to free uh, these men? We know we've been reporting that Japan's Deputy Foreign Minister has been in Jordan pretty much all this week to try and coordinate efforts with officials there. Yeah, that's right. And much of those talks and efforts, of course, has remained secretive, secretive, understandably. But we are hearing from Bloomberg uh, reporting that there are indirect talks ongoing between the Islamic State militants and representatives of Japan and Jordan. Now, it cites Jordan's chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, who said the negotiations are taking place through religious and tribal leaders in Iraq. And it remains to be seen, though, whether whether Amman and Tokyo are open to a prisoner swap there. Japan's representative, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Yasuhide Nakayama, publicly only expressed his hope that the two hostages can return home, quote, with a smile on their face. Now, late Tuesday, several hundred uh, had gathered in the cities of Amman and Karak in Jordan, calling for their government to meet the demands and free the young pilot. Yeah, and several reports saying that the 24-hour deadline is set to expire at 11 o'clock tonight, Korea time. So in uh, slightly under 13 hours. And of course, we'll keep you updated on this story throughout the day, of course. Now, let's turn our eyes now to Poland, where world leaders uh, gathered with the survivors of the Auschwitz camp, uh, because Tuesday marked the 70th anniversary since its liberation. That's right, and there were remembrances around the world, but yes, hundreds of people did gather at the site of the death camp itself, which of course has become a symbol of the Holocaust and the brutalities of the Nazi troops. Now, a few of the camp survivors, then children, took the stage and urged people not to forget. For if you, the leaders in the world, will remember and to teach others to remember then the Holocaust and other atrocities like Darfur, Biafra, Kosovo, as well as attacks as the present one in Paris will have no place on the face of the earth. Some 300 survivors, as well as the leaders of Poland, Germany, and France, were among those in attendance to remember and honor the deceased. An estimated 1.5 million people, mostly European Jews, were gassed, shot, hanged, and burned at Auschwitz during World War II before its liberation in the winter of 1945. The event could mark one of the last major anniversaries attended by a large showing of survivors, Mark, given that the youngest are now in their 70s. Well, Eunice, thank you very much for your reports today, and we'll see you back at noon. See you then. The top U.S. official in South Korea has expressed his support for Seoul in its bitter diplomatic row with Tokyo over Japan's past wrongdoings. U.S. Ambassador to South Korea Mark Lippert said Washington is aware that Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of tens of thousands of Korean women and girls is a highly emotive issue in Korea. Hwang sang -hee reports. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's seemingly unapologetic attitude about Japan's wartime atrocities is drawing concerns from the United States. In an interview on Tuesday, U.S. Ambassador to South Korea Mark Lippert recognized the gravity of the so-called comfort women issue. Um, the President of the United States, when he was here in April, uh, called the, the treatment uh, shocking. Um, so we, we, um, we, we know that it's, it's tough and a very emotional issue. 
The unresolved matter of Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women has been the biggest thorn in Seoul and Tokyo's bilateral ties. Abe stirred things up this week by hinting that his so-called Abe statement may drop words of apology used in statements by his predecessors. He is set to unveil it this summer to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. Lippert expressed U.S. support for the existing Kono and Murayama statements and addressed President Park Geun-hye's recent efforts to mend ties. We found that uh, President Park's recent proposal of a trilateral foreign minister meeting uh, as a constructive step that could possibly lead to a trilateral summit. The ambassador welcomed Seoul's efforts to improve relations with Pyongyang, saying the U.S. has no concerns with the speed or scope of the inter-Korean dialogue proposed by President Park. And when will Washington be ready to engage with the communist state? That, he said, is when the North is willing to take steps for a complete, irreversible, verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Hwang sang Arirang News. Legendary American investor Jim Rogers has long agreed with South Korean President Park Geun-hye that a unified Korea would be an economic force to be reckoned with. Arirang News recently spoke with Mr. Rogers about the prospects of investing in North Korea when the two Koreas hopefully reunify. Kwon Suha has more. Reunification of the two Koreas would mean a lot for the people of South and North Korea. But for foreigners, ample opportunities to make big bucks, at least for investors. Financial experts from around the world see tremendous business potentials in the northern part of the peninsula once unification is achieved. Jim Rogers, the chairman of Rogers Holdings, a legendary investor with a minimum of 300 million U.S. dollars in assets, voiced his willingness to invest all of his assets into North Korea if the two Koreas are unified. You're going to have a country of 75 million people right on the Chinese border, vast natural resources in the north, huge amounts of cheap, disciplined labor in the north. In the south, you have lots of capital, lots of brains, lots of management ability. It's going to be unbelievably exciting. How big will the economy be? I have no idea, but it's going to be a lot bigger than the combined economy is now. Rogers says while Japan is not fond of the idea of a unified Korea, which will emerge as its strong competitor, China and Russia are already very interested in investing in the North. They've just built two new docks in Razoon. If you look at a map, the, the Razoon is the northernmost ice-free port in Asia. So you put goods into the port, put them on the train, and Russia has just rebuilt the railroad into Razoon, so that's going to be one good that they want it to be, and it will be, a transportation hub going forward. But they've got huge minerals. In 1972, North Korea was richer than South Korea, with vast natural resources. They still have them. They've been ruined by the communists. So you go there, open yourself a mine. Silver, coal, iron ore, there are plenty of things you can do there. The only item the American businessman has purchased so far is North Korean coins due to the many sanctions imposed on the North by the U.S. But Rogers has hope for future investments after meeting with people in the North Korean regime. When asked about which sectors should be targeted, Rogers says underdeveloped North Korea basically needs everything. Kwon Suha, Arirang News. Now, it's one of the most popular and well-known productions here in Korea, and it features drum beats and kitchen utensils. Nanta recently made history for being the most watched Korean production of all time. For more on what this means for Korea's performing arts arena, here's Connie Lee. There's a lot of drumming, beating, knife-wielding and acting. This is just a brief behind-the-scenes look at Korea's very own production of Nanta. The rhythmic show just made history, hitting the 10 million viewer mark at home and abroad at the end of last year. That makes this not only the longest-running show in Korea, now in its 18th year, but also the most-watched Korean production of all time. For a local theatrical production to hit 10 million viewers, it's unheard of. But Nanta did it. 
This gives hope to other locally made productions that they too could succeed. PMC Production, the firm behind the show, celebrated this week and honored the original cast members pictured on the trademark Nanta poster. You might recognize some of them, like actor Liu Sung Leung, who's had a recent string of hit movies. The nonverbal show about a group of chefs cooking for a wedding banquet came to life in 1997 by longtime actor turned producer and director Song Sung Hwan. I was inspired by childhood memories of hearing my mother cook in the kitchen. I wanted to create a show that incorporated the traditional Korean rhythms of samulori and thought the kitchen had a number of items that could create those beats. After two years, the show, also known as Cookin' in the West, hit the global stage, becoming the first Korean production to enter the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in 1999, and then in 2003, becoming Korea's debut on Broadway. Since then, Nanta has toured the globe and has been shown more than 31,000 times in 289 cities and 51 different countries. Critics rave about the show's comedic features, its family-friendly nature and the fun Korean beats that can get any crowd going. When I first created the show, I didn't think it would last this long. Today, I see even greater opportunities for Korean-made productions to succeed even more abroad. Officials now have their eyes set squarely on China, as Ananta Theater is set to be built in Guangzhou by this June. Connie Lee, Arirang News. And a good Wednesday morning to you all as we kick things off with our ongoing 2015 Asian Cup coverage as the host nation Australia faced off against the UAE on Tuesday with the winner set to play against Korea on Saturday for the Asian Cup final. And it didn't take long for Australia to get on board as Trent Sainsbury scores just three minutes into the match giving Australia the early 1-0 lead. But we're not done yet. Less than 10 minutes after that is Jason Davison this time. Make that 2-0 Australia. And we're not even done with the first 20 minutes of the match. And what do you know? That's all the Aldi scoring here the rest of the way as Australia advanced to the final with the big match against Korea set for this Saturday. Now aside from Korea's first trip to the Asian Cup final in 27 years, the other major sports news in the nation are the ongoing reports of Pak Tae-hwan testing positive for steroids. And now, he's set to face an international hearing. Now, with the Olympic swimmer feeling a test administered by the International Swimming Governing Body, the state prosecutors in Seoul reported that Park received a testosterone injection at the hospital last July. And while the doctor who administered these shots stated that the contents of the injection would be safe, the prosecutors may now charge the doctor of professional negligence. Meanwhile, according to a World Anti-Doping Agency official, Park's penalty will be determined after a hearing with FINA. The PGA season is in full swing, but Korea's Pesang Moon season might come to an end before the end of this week. Well, it's because his military issue hasn't been resolved and he's told to return to Korea. Now, with the 29-year-old unable to receive extension on his overseas visa, he's been asked to return to Korea before the 30th of this month. And while it doesn't seem like the two-time PGA Tour winner is listening to the request, the Tegu Regional Military Manpower Office made it clear that if he doesn't return by the requested date, he will have to face the prosecutors. Meanwhile, he's set to compete this weekend at the Phoenix Open. The 2015 MLB season is still about two months away now, as baseball fans in the nation are looking forward to Lee Hyun-jin's third year with the Dodgers. Of course, his first two years were pretty good as he's already won 28 games. But did you know he's number one when it comes to holding the runners in the past two years? Well, it's true as stats show that in the past two years, there's been 578 runners on base with an opportunity to steal a base. But only six runners have actually attempted to steal a base. That comes out to an astonishing 96.3% base runner hold rate and number one in the past two seasons. An overlooked stat for many as his ability to hold a runner is actually prevents more runs from scoring. 
And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. This morning, and the bone chilling temperature and wind chill will persist throughout the day with highs climbing into what it was like yesterday. And more snow of up to 10 centimeters is in store for parts of the east, so beware of heavy snowfall, while the rest of the country should have another bright day under mostly sunny skies. And here are the readings for today. The daytime high in Seoul will only pick at zero, while Busan top out at seven this afternoon. And for the other regions, Jeju Island should see a high of six, while Tejon will top out at two. That's all for the weather. Back to you, Mark. Well, thank you very much, Jeon, for the weather. And that's all we have for now. Plenty more stories online. And we'll be back with our next newscast at noon, Korea time. Until then, goodbye.